You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and let's start today with another story that has rocked some people's holidays. You guys, I feel like the last few weeks, I've told multiple stories where people are suffering during what should be such a joyous time. So let's get into this one. Eight years ago, Tyler Goodrich was just enjoying his time in a bar in downtown Lincoln, Nebraska. It was basically just another night. But then Marshall Vogel walked past Tyler. The two made eye contact and the sparks flew from there. Two years later, the two men were exchanging vows and building a life together. Now, according to Dateline, Marshall said Tyler and him wanted kids. Obviously, adoption would be a potential route for the couple. And after talking it through, the two decided to become licensed to foster a child, hoping that would turn into an eventual adoption. As the two were working their way through the licensing process, they got a call from the agency that was helping them through their journey. A 14-year-old boy was available to foster immediately, and the two jumped at the opportunity. After two years of parenting, their oldest son, that boy's half-brother, also entered the foster system, and Tyler and Marshall were a natural fit. In April, their youngest son was officially adopted, and the family of four were blending and moving and thriving. Well, by Halloween of 2023, it was time for celebrations to begin. Tyler's father and mother always hosted a large party that the grandkids would come over in costumes and show off their creations to their grandparents and cousins, probably much like all of us have done at some time. Well, Tyler's dad said the party was exactly what he had hoped it would be. Nothing unusual, just Halloween fun. But that Friday, following Halloween, took a turn. Marshall and Tyler were examining their relationship. And if you've been in a long-term relationship, you know, like you know that things ebb and flow. Sometimes it's nothing short of perfect. And then sometimes it has thorny areas. Well, on that day, Tyler had been at work in Omaha where he served as a corrections officer. Tyler and Marshall had agreed that they would do something that would potentially soften the night. They would just eat pizza and watch a movie with their sons. So Tyler stopped at a local Costco to pick up the pizza before returning home. And at first, it was just three of the four family members. Tyler and Marshall's oldest son was at work, but he would be returning soon and they could enjoy the night together. However, the thorns of the marriage presented themselves even though the best intentions were laid to have a peaceful night. Marshall told Dateline that things were tough between the two. He said they knew that they loved each other, but that maybe they had realized their marriage wasn't intended to be forever. So they didn't let that argument die. And on that night, words turned ugly and heated. So ugly, Marshall made an audio recording of the exchange between the two. And eventually, Marshall called 911 at about 7.45 that night, before the first responders could arrive to, you know, settle the domestic dispute. Tyler left on foot, and he hasn't been seen since. When the police arrived, they spent about half an hour chatting with Marshall and just really verifying that the situation was going to be okay. They eventually left, and Marshall and the boys went on with their lives for the next 14-ish hours. That is until Marshall called 911 again. This time, the distress was different. Marshall told investigators he hadn't heard from Tyler since he left the night before at 740. And the next few days, family and friends kicked the search into high gear. By Sunday, a Facebook group titled Let's Find Tyler Goodrich had been started. That Facebook group today has 12,000 followers. And by Monday, a search warrant is served at the home that Tyler and Marshall shared. All right, you guys can take the idea of a search warrant for whatever you will. It can be interpreted in a few ways. Marshall did hire a lawyer before the Monday search warrant. That's less than two days that his husband has been missing. Now, people would say that obviously makes him look guilty. But others would say that is exactly what he should have done. Whatever you think. 
Because of the legal counsel that was hired, a search warrant was needed. But you guys, detectives find nothing. In fact, nothing seems to be the reoccurring theme in this investigation. There was nothing out of the ordinary in the house. There's no activity on Tyler's bank account or his credit cards. There's no online activity. And there's no sightings after he left the neighborhood. And there's no cell phone activity. In fact, his last cell phone ping was at 741 when he left the house on that Friday. Now, Tyler's father told Dateline that Tyler couldn't be off his phone for more than five minutes. So no activity just doesn't check out. And my next question when researching the story was, is this possibly a coping mechanism for Tyler? You know how some people are like runners. They have to just get out of a situation in order to protect themselves. Well, his father says, absolutely not. This is not behavior that Tyler has exhibited before. And his life plans don't necessarily lead you to believe he was planning on leaving. The Sunday of his disappearance, Tyler was actually supposed to be running in a team marathon. And this was something he absolutely loved to do. He was also going to be spending the day with friends at that marathon. Another thing he loved to do. Those friends say he wouldn't let them down by not showing up for the race. Now, this next part of the story, it's actually pretty amazing to me. The Lincoln, Nebraska Parks and Rec Department went on to create a virtual map that allowed searchers to mark off quadrants that had been searched while looking for Tyler. Then that information could be shared with the police department, which allowed them to utilize the dozens of volunteers who were searching for Tyler. But again, you guys, nothing is the theme. No clothing. No shoes, no phone, nothing was found in those searches. Well, as the disappearance case moved forward, some confusing information happened in the next week. According to the Lincoln Journal Star, Lancaster County Chief Deputy Ben Hooshin says Marshall is no longer cooperating with the investigation. Then, just a few days later, He retracts that. He changes his tune and says Marshall is cooperating fully and that the two boys Marshall and Tyler shared have been interviewed by the FBI. Okay, again, do with that what you will. I will say this. Marshall was interviewed by Dateline and does appear to be helping the investigation now. So another question I know you're asking is, what about cameras? Well, Tyler was caught on a neighbor's home security camera. It's brief about two seconds of film where you can see Tyler running from the home on that Friday night. But again, nothing after that. And the direction that Tyler is seen running in that two second video is ultra confusing to his family and friends. See, Tyler and Marshall have a bigger property, a decent amount of land that they live on. If Tyler actually left in the direction of the back of the property, which matches the home security footage, then he is entering into some difficult territory because once you get past the barns, the terrain becomes very difficult to walk through. It seems to be full of thorny locust trees and briars, and he would have been navigating that in the dark. But if he didn't head off that way, then why isn't he seen returning via the home security camera footage? He's only spotted once on that camera, and that's when he's headed to the back of the property. Well, detectives have tried to secure additional footage from other nearby properties, but they've had no luck. The support of Tyler has been tremendous. From my vantage point, it seems he was dearly loved. His good friend Rachel told Dateline that Tyler loved working for the Department of Corrections and that his coworkers helped significantly in the searches for Tyler. Tyler also served in the military and his old military friends that he is still close with Well, they showed up to volunteer. And in his extensive interview with Dateline, Marshall said he is truly grateful for everything that friends and coworkers have done. He said Tyler knows that he is protecting their two boys while people are out there helping. Now, the Lancaster Sheriff's Office says the case is an open and active missing persons case. The office is also saying that people who have been missing for a couple of weeks or even a couple of months or even a couple of years, will surface alive and well. The investigators are hoping this is the case. However, Tyler's dad, Lonnie, 
he feels differently. He told NBC that he knows his son too well. He said he would never do this to his family. He says his son is surely dead and not missing. Lonnie just had a birthday, and Tyler's mom just had a birthday as well. So Lonnie is clear that Tyler would not have missed those birthdays or Thanksgiving or Christmas. He said he believes, along with other family and friends, that someone hurt Tyler. He goes so far as to speculate that Tyler was harmed on the very night that he went missing and that somebody did it and somebody knows. All right, how can we help? Well, Tyler is six feet, one inches tall with a lean runner's body. He has pale skin and freckles with red hair. And at the time of his disappearance, his hair was longer, kind of near his shoulders, and he had a full beard. If you can help in any way with finding Tyler, Tips can be called into the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office at 402-441-6500. And I want to share just a quick memory about Tyler that you I've just seen published in multiple places. And I'm guessing that's because it's the memory his family is holding on to. See, when Tyler was young, like elementary school age, Tyler came home and asked his father if they could bake cookies for the lunchroom cooks. His reasoning? The cooks made cookies every day for the kids, and they deserve to have the same kind of act done for them. Lonnie told the Lincoln Journal star that Tyler was just kind like that, and he never changed as he grew older. Tyler has three sisters and one brother who, Lonnie says, love him very much. Their bond is so tight, they don't use the words stepbrother or stepsister, even though that phrase would apply to the family's situation. Now, Tyler golfed in high school, and he played basketball and ran track. Lonnie says he was never a sit-in-front-of-the-TV kid. He loved being outdoors, and, of course, he enjoyed running in his mature years. Tyler was determined, and in recent years, he completed a master's degree in just 14 weeks. His father said he was a finisher who was confident in his decisions. All right, sitting on the outside looking in, that desired attribute of being a finisher and you know following through on your decisions, well, that could possibly lead him to finish the part where he's leaving his family. Or it could possibly mean he would never leave his family because he's gonna finish out the part about being a husband and a father. So that just leaves us one thing, a mystery with nearly no answers. I'll be watching this case closely but it could be a very long time before we have any additional information. Okay, now on to Pennsylvania with another tragic murder around the holidays that has left five children without both of their parents. And this story is pretty fresh, so I'll give you what I know. I'm sure more will come out, but here's what happened five days before Christmas this year. 34-year-old Brooke Nia Zimmerman and her husband, 39-year-old Blaze Rea, were at home with four of the five kids they shared as a recently married couple. Okay, from what I can tell, it was a his and hers blended together type of family. Brooke had two sons, Camden and Easton, from previous relationships. And Blaze had three children, a daughter named Blakely and two sons, Blaze Jr. and Brennan. And it seems the two were almost destined to cross paths, if not end up together. Blaze, who worked as a machinist for the railroad company Norfolk Southern, grew up in the area, and he became involved in the local racing circuit and even started his own online racing group with over 1,200 members in their Facebook group back in 2020. Blaze and his buddy Bob Welsh were both drag racers who saw a need when the local tracks were closed due to COVID. So the two grew the idea into a several week live event that led to sponsorships and awards for those participating. It seems to just be in his blood. So of course, Brooke and Blaze would cross paths because racing was in her DNA as well. Her father, Don Zimmerman, was a well-known motorcycle racer who transitioned to announcing at a local speedway. How could the two not bump into each other? And for Brooke's part, she was an athlete as well. A former high school basketball star, Brooke would still suit up and play in alumni games with her Blue Pirate teammates. 
And the group of women, well, they called themselves the Bad Moms Club. She also worked as the office manager of Traficante Family Chiropractic. You know, I bring you these stories, and from the outside looking in, you think, what a perfect pairing. They have so much in common. This blended family could thrive with all of their activities so mutually enjoyed. But that's just it. We never know. And five days before Christmas, it all came crashing down for Brooke and Blaze. See, the two were arguing. And at this point, who knows over what? But they were in the basement of their Greenwood, Pennsylvania home when Blaze allegedly shot Brooke in the head and then turned the gun on himself, also shooting himself in the head. And like I said, the four youngest children were home during the murder-suicide. And then just a short half hour later, the oldest child returned from work and discovered the horrific scene before calling 911. Now, following the nightmarish discovery, detectives question all five children before releasing them into the care of the individual family members. And even though this case seems open and shut, like for you, me and you, we probably think murder-suicide, done deal. But the state police and Logan Township officers aren't closing the case just quite yet. According to the Logan Police Chief, Dave Hoover, investigators are trying to backfill the day, working backwards through Brooke and Blaze's events on that Tuesday to try and determine what caused the emotions for such a violent exchange. He also said the department is trying to rule out definitively that there were not other people involved in the murder of Brooke. I included this case on this Thursday because despite the happiness that a majority of people experience every holiday season, the painful truth is some people will never feel joy to a level that you or I might feel. My heart breaks for these five children. Everyday life is going to be just rough. Then when the holidays roll around, unbearable might be the word to explain it. And I don't really anticipate any updates in this case, but I will still keep an eye out for anything new. And for our third case, let's head to a foreign country for what has some Lorena Bobbitt undertones. And I bet half of you are like, Lorena who? Well, in 1993, I was 20 years old, and Lorena became famous for her highly publicized, shall we say, removal of her husband's manhood after she had suffered years of alleged abuse by an aggressive spouse. In her story, she cut off her husband, John Wayne Bobbitt's penis with a kitchen knife and then fled with the body part still clutched in her hand and eventually throwing that body part in a nearby field as she drove past. Okay, are you ready to be shocked? They reattached the organ to John Wayne Bobbitt. See, Lorena, in her state of shock, drove to her boss's home and told that woman what she had done. Her boss called 911 and told the dispatch operator where she felt Lorena had thrown the organ from her speeding car. Well, police found the organ. They drove to a nearby 7-Eleven, grabbed ice and a hot dog wrapper, put the organ on ice wrapped in the hot dog wrapper, and then drove to the hospital. Doctors successfully reattached the manhood. Now, John Wayne Bobbitt said that the happiest day of his life happened when he was awakened by the doctor and told that the surgery had been a success. He said it was like opening Christmas presents on Christmas Day when you're a little kid. It was that level of excitement. You guys, all of what I'm telling you is true. Check it out for yourself. Now, to the story that had me remembering the tabloid sensation that was Lorena Bobbitt. Okay, wait, I've got to preface this first. Lorena was a tabloid sensation. And I mean, I just gave you a small Cliff Notes version that I'm sure you're shocked by. You can find talk show interviews and newspaper interviews, video of her talking about this. It was a big deal for a few years. But I need to remind everybody, remember that domestic violence issues are always a serious matter, even when they're handled in a shocking way, like Lorena Bobbitt handled her domestic violence. Okay, this 
everything I just told you, it's true for the story out of Brazil that I'm bringing you today. A 34-year-old Brazilian woman said she discovered that her husband had allegedly slept with her 15-year-old niece. Now, the age of consent in Brazil is 14, and I'm sure you're shocked by that as well. So the relationship between the 39-year-old man and the 15-year-old niece could have legally been consensual. And I've got lots of opinions about that subject, but I'm here to just tell you this story. So we'll hold my opinions. Well, the woman thinks her husband has slept with a 15-year-old. So what does she do? She seduces him, teasing him into the bedroom and encouraging him to be tied up. After his legs and arms were securely bound, she pulled out a razor and hacked off his manhood. She then takes a picture of the severed organ before flushing it down the toilet. And wait, there's more. She then drives to the police station with her brother and turns herself in saying, Good evening, officer. I came to introduce myself because I just cut off my husband's penis. She told the officers that she flushed the organ because she had heard it could be reattached and she did not want that to happen for her husband. Well, of course, first responders rushed to the home of the married couple where they found the husband still bound but alive and the wife has now been charged with attempted murder and is in police custody. There is never a dull moment in true crime. Well, that's your Thursday episode of Rise in Crime. You guys, I love your case suggestions. Send them on in and give us a like and a follow as well as hitting that subscribe button. Thanks for being here with me and join me again on Monday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules and keep safe out there.